Hello. Today I want to talk about the third phase in the force cycle. And the force cycle is a way for you to improve your uh, spoken proficiency and your understanding of a foreign language by interacting with the target language community. And uh, I do this all the time. It's more of an automatic thing rather than an intentional or deliberate process for me now. But it's helpful to have a structure and to have a plan and to uh, know that you can go out and wherever you go you have a chance of uh, improving your proficiency before you come home. So we've talked so far about the first two cycle, the first two phases of the four cycle, which are focus, that is uh, set a set a target that you a new proficiency that you're going to develop. Uh, might be a new grammatical structure. It might be a new a new theme that you're going to talk about. A new a bunch of uh, vocabulary that you want to use and and uh, internalize through through practice. So that's focus. Uh, f uh, focus first. Second is organize, and you collect the material that you're going to use when you get into a real life conversation. So now uh, the third phase of the fourth cycle is called rehearse. So. Uh, what you do before you get into a live conversation is you practice the material that you're going to use when you get into that conversation. I can remember doing this uh, when I was going to a Chinese restaurant, knowing that I was going to ask for the menu and ask for chopsticks and ask how much, how much things cost, uh, and I practiced before I got there. So that's the rehearsal uh, stage. What you uh, do at this phase is you uh, rehearse the material that you have collected in the organize phase of the four cycle. So you've got all your words and phrases and maybe some new grammatical patterns and you you rehearse them, you say them over and over until they become something that you know that you're going to be able to use when you get into a live a live conversation. And you should have a a fairly small amount of material that you're going to use at this time, especially when you're at the lower levels of proficiency. For me right now, uh, one of the languages I've been talking about lately that I'm working on is Tagalog. And my knowledge of Tagalog is very limited. So for me to rehearse uh, a half a dozen sentences and expressions, uh, it's a good workout. It's a good language workout. Now at a, at a higher level, if I'm speaking Portuguese or something, uh, then I, I'll have a, a, an awful lot more uh, material at that point. So you don't have to say much, but the point of the rehearse phase of the cycle is that although you don't say much, you can say it well. So you want to practice what you're going to say in live conversation. So how do you do that? Uh, as I said, start with very small amounts of uh, information, especially at the lower levels of proficiency. Uh, don't try to take on too much. And one of the things that you will do when you rehearse is make sure that your pronunciation is fairly good. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. Of course, if you're using recordings, you can listen to the recordings and imitate what you hear. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. There's two other things that I find fairly helpful, and this is not for everybody. So. You know, whatever works for you, there's there's just so many things that you could do, uh, but find the tools that are most useful for you. Two things that I really like, I, I found it helpful to learn the International Phonetic Alphabet. It's called the IPA, and it looks kind of intimidating. Um, it looks like, a, looks like a, a squiggly, messed up Roman alphabet, but what it does is it lets you check the pronunciation in languages that are not entirely phonetic all the time. For example, in French, um, uh, some t generally speaking, the last letters on a French word are not pronounced, and there's a rule that says usually you pronounce the, uh, the consonants from the word, the English word careful, C, R, F, and L careful. So usually you pronounce the C, R, F, and L at the end of a word, but not with infinitives. And, you know, there's certain rules that you, you can, that will help you to pronounce your words well. But there are some words that just break the rules, and there's nothing you can do about it except learn the pronunciation word by word. French is a lot more phonetic than English is, by the way. If you're learning French, you might feel like, wow, this is hard to figure out how to pronounce, you know, some words, and there's all these irregularities. English is way worse than that. But in a good French dictionary and uh, in some French vocabulary books and textbooks, uh, on the in the dictionary on my iPhone, it has the International Phonetic Alphabet. And that lets you just check, you know, do I pronounce the S on the French word for the word bus? Generally speaking, an S on the end of a word is not pronounced. But on the word bus, the French word for bus, is it pronounced or not? 
I'll let you check it out. You can uh, go learn the International Phonetic Alphabet. And uh, some uh, online dictionaries also will show you pronunciation. And usually they use the International Phonetic Alphabet. Uh, another thing, another tool that I find quite helpful is a website called Forvo, F-O-R-V-O. They have an iPhone app and they have a, a website that you can go to uh, in your browser. And what's really cool is you enter in a word in your target language, lots of languages available. Uh, you enter the word and you search for it and it will give you someone pronouncing that word uh, who is a native speaker. And often you will find more than one person pronouncing the word. So if you're learning French, you can hear some uh, people from France pronouncing your target word. And you can hear some Quebecers pronouncing the word, maybe some Swiss people, some Belgians, some Africans. With Portuguese, you might hear um, Brazilian pronunciation and continental Portuguese. With Spanish, you could hear Mexican and Argentine. So you can, you can get lots of different sounds. Uh, Often it doesn't matter, you know, often the, the sounds are so similar. But that's really cool because you can uh, hear native uh, level proficiency, pronunciation, and you can double check your, your own pronunciation so that when you are pr rehearsing the target language material, you know you get it right. What you don't want to do is rehearse something wrong over and over again and burn it into your brain and go around pronouncing the word bus wrong in French for the rest of your life. So make sure that you get it right before you start uh, uh, internalizing it and making this new material your own. Uh, use recordings, as I said, use them if you have them, and carefully imitate the recordings that you have. Some people are really good at this. Uh, they hear what they say. They can imitate accents in their own language. Uh, some people who speak English can imitate an Australian accent or a, a southern U.S. accent or my western Canadian uh, accent. Uh, so listen really closely to any recordings you have and try to try to imitate them as closely as you can. Uh, you can uh, even exaggerate what you think you hear because when you overdo it, what it sounds to you like overdoing it and exaggerating it is probably coming closer to the actual sound than you think. Generally speaking, you have to exaggerate the sound that you hear in order to come to come closer to the way that a native speaker would pronounce the words or the sounds that you're trying to trying to learn. Listen repeatedly if you're using recordings. Don't just listen once or twice. I listen to recordings of dialogues or texts many, many times. Um, and when I tell my students how many times, sometimes they think, oh no, I could never do that. And I don't want to discourage them, but just between you and me, and please keep this a secret between the few thousand uh, viewers on YouTube. <laughs> Let's keep this a secret. I listen to these these uh, dialogues 50 times, 100 times, in some languages, 200 times. Very small amounts of texts, you know, a few minutes, two, three minutes. And I'll listen to them over and over and over again. And you'll find that many uh, uh, accomplished language students do the same thing. Uh, so listen repeatedly, but listen with focused attention. Putting on a CD in the car while you drive and hearing something in the background I think has some value, but there's, there is particular value in uh, really focusing on what you're listening to and giving some focused attention to uh, learning the sounds of the material that you're going to use in your next live conversation in your force cycle. Uh, you want to uh, trust your ears. One of the mistakes that I notice very commonly with uh, language students is that we rely on written texts to learn pronunciation. And that is not reliable, even, I would say, in the most phonetic languages that I have studied. You have to hear how the language sounds. Written text can give you some clues and it can be helpful. And in languages like Spanish, it will take you very, it will give you very good, very good clues. But you have to trust your ears. Uh, listen carefully. And I think it's also valuable to listen without referring to the written text. Uh, don't have the written text in front of you. When I use uh, Asimil books for uh, learning uh, languages, uh, for French, I will generally listen to the material many times before I even let my eyes see the written text. And I find that when I'm, when I'm pushing the upper levels of my proficiency level, at first, uh, with certain languages, I'm listening to a new piece of material, I don't understand very much. 
but I don't go to the written text right away. I listen to it and listen to it and listen to it, and I find that it starts to make sense with, and I can't entirely explain it, without any further information, it starts to make sense a little better. But at some point you can look at the at the written text. Um, uh, it's not very effective to look at the at the written material right away. So listen to it first. Um, and if you look at the written text without imitating recordings, um, what I find is that my students will often have a, a strong English accent because they're looking uh, they're, they're sounding things out and they are referring to English phonetics to some degree and they are trying to make their speech match what they saw rather than what they heard. So uh, listen more than you than you read when you're learning how to pronounce new material. Uh, the best training from your mouth comes from your ears, uh, not from your eyes. So listen and uh, let your mouth get get its information from there. Reading is not a substitute for listening. Listen to your target language as much as you can and not just when you're preparing for a force cycle. Uh, I've mentioned that here in Canada we get uh, Canadian on, on Canadian TV we get French news programs and on the radio as well. So I have every opportunity to listen to hours and hours of French spoken by native speakers and I intentionally do that. I do not watch the news in English anymore. I only watch in French, and I listen to the radio in French. Uh, and this is not to intensely, st intensively study what I'm hearing, but it is to just fill my ears with the sounds of the rhythm and the vocabulary and the expressions of French, and to absorb a lot of French outside of uh, um, intentional study times. If you don't have recordings, and depending on the written uh, the written cues you have for your rehearsal. Um, you should try to read as accurately as possible. Um, if, you're, if you're dealing strictly with written material, read accurately and make sure that you get it right. Again, you don't want to internalize and uh, burn something into your brain that is full of mistakes. Try to learn the accent of native speakers. Imitate what you hear and, as I mentioned, exaggerate what you hear. I remember when a friend of mine from Quebec was trying to teach me to pronounce uh, the the word for a ah in French, the masculine uh, singular uh, indefinite article. I'm trying to get all grammatical on you. The word un. And the first time I saw her say it, she said I was saying it all wrong. I don't know what I was saying. I was probably saying un or I don't know what I was doing. But she was showing me. She stood right in front of me about, about uh, you know, one foot distance from my face. And she she said, no, no, don't say it like that. You say un. Ah. And I was watching her mouth move from side to side. Uh, and she was really exaggerating. But when I imitated that, almost to make fun of her, she said, oh, that's it. That's way better than what you said a minute ago. So when you hear native speakers, imitate what they say, exaggerate it a little bit, and you're probably a lot closer. Don't be afraid to boldly imitate what you hear. It's probably more accurate than what you suspect. Now let's talk about why you do this rehearse uh, phase in the cycle. What it does is it prepares you by building confidence. So when you go out to use your target language and you know that you set a particular focus, you know you're going to limit the conversation to a particular theme or perhaps a particular pattern in the language, you'll feel a lot more confident if you walk into it knowing that the things that you're about to say, you've said them many times before and you're really familiar with, with what you're about to say, you can almost do it without thinking. You have prepared and prepared, so you're really confident. And you don't hesitate. You don't find yourself saying, ah, um, uh, that drives people crazy. Way better to speak badly and keep it going than it is to speak very, very accurately and fill it with, um, uh, uh, sea, uh, como se dice. You don't, you don't want all of that kind of stuff. Just keep the flow going. So uh, rehearsal uh, reduces your hesitation. It also keeps the other person interested and engaged. If you're talking with somebody in a language that is not your own and you're not completely proficient in this language yet, but you keep it going and you keep it moving, you will find that the person you're talking with will stay with you, will be more interested and engaged if you can just keep talking. 
your accuracy is not the most important thing at that point. Of course, you have to be accurate enough that the other person knows what you're saying, but it's very important that you minimize the hesitation and show some confidence so that they're not feeling bad for you, that you look like a uh, like a, like you've been caught in a trap or something and you're struggling to escape. If you look like you're confident and you have an idea of what you're doing, the other person will keep talking with you. Mistakes and all, that's fine. Uh, rehearsing also prepares you to be as fluent as possible. Fluency, again, is not about precision and accuracy. It's about a flow. It's about keeping the language moving and flowing and sounding at, at a relatively normal speed and... and um, uh, so the other person can participate in something that feels like a relatively normal conversation. So how long should you rehearse? How much practice should you do? I would say there are a few key indicators. Uh, first of all, rehearse until you can say the material that you have organized uh, in the organized phase of the force cycle. Uh, rehearse it until you can say it at a relatively normal speed. So I can remember learning how to ask somebody if they speak Tagalog, in Tagalog. And these words are so long and so different from English that it took me a quite a bit of practice to be able to say, Nagsasalita ba ikaw ng Tagalog? The first time I saw the word Nagsasalita, I thought, I could never learn how to pronounce that. But, you know, it's rehearsal, and I knew that rehearsing would, would help. So what I often do with long words that I haven't seen before is I start with the last syllable and add on each syllable going uh, towards the left. So in, in English and in Tagalog, we write, we write and we pronounce from left to right. When I'm dealing with a foreign word, I often start going from right to left. For some reason, pronouncing a word syllable by syllable or piece by piece uh, in the... Uh, the non-normal, the abnormal order makes it easier to learn. I think because you're not thinking of it as a word. You're thinking of it as a series of sounds and you're focusing on getting the sounds right. So I would take a word like nagsasalita and I would take ta, lita, salita, salita. And I would say the last part a few times, sasalita. And I would add on uh, syllables until I could say nagsasalita. And then I would take this, this whole expression, nagsasalita bahikaw ng Tagalog, and repeat this over and over and over. I, I am sure that I repeated this sentence 150 times before the first time I tried it out on a, on a Filipino person. And with some languages, you have, to, you have to practice very small amounts of text repeatedly. Chinese, for me, it's the same way, because I haven't done a, to a tonal language before. I will practice one sentence dozens and dozens of times before I say it. So, And I'm, I'm trying to get it to the point where I can say it at normal speed. I also want to be able to say it with some fluency, with little or no hesitation, so that I can just rattle it off, rattle it off without pausing and thinking about did I get my verb tense right or anything. I just say, "Nagsasalita ba ikaw ng Tagalog?" I don't even think I don't know what kind of verb endings are on there or what pronouns are in there. I know what each word means, but I'm, that's not what I'm thinking about. I can say it fluently, and I I also rehearse until my pronunciation can be understood. Again, with some languages, that's not a simple task for Chinese. I remember one time I was uh, speaking in Chinese with a lady and she said to me, are you talking to me in Chinese? <laughs> it was that bad. My pronunciation was that bad. So you want to make sure that your pronunciation is accurate enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. You Maybe you'll never have a perfect accent in your target language. But you want to be accurate enough that at least the person can identify what language you, you think you're speaking. And uh, you also want to rehearse until you can say your words and phrases without any written clues. And so that you actually own this material. You're walking in and you're, you're like the, the actor who is on stage. You don't have any script with you. You're just ready to go. You're ready to talk about uh, whatever it is that you're going to have your conversation about. Perhaps you're going to talk about music in your target language. And you've got all the words. You've got all the expressions. You can talk about, I like this artist, and I like that artist, and I like this style of music. And you've got it all inside you. You're not relying on written clues. So that's the rehearse cycle, the, the rehearse phase of the force cycle. And uh, in the next video, we'll talk about the fourth phase 
of the fourth cycle, which is communicate. See you there.